A while back I made this video about the legalities of radio scanning and it seemed to cause quite a stir, so I thought I would clear up the subject once and for all. Now, for the most part, radio scanning is against the law, as you shouldn't be receiving transmissions that aren't intended for you, but bear with me, I'm going to explain everything. Now, of course, this law is not really enforced, although there have been some exceptions, which I'll come to, and I myself have always been an avid radio scanner, but back in the 1980s and 1990s, when scanners flooded the market, it made an interesting topic for debate. It wasn't until the early 70s that hobbyist receivers came onto the market, and even then, the cost of these radios was somewhat prohibitive. They were crystal controlled, which limited them massively, but the advent of synthesised scanners changed everything. All of a sudden, everything from taxi drivers and couriers to police and government transmissions could be monitored easily. It became a bit of a craze to listen in on your neighbours' cordless and mobile phone calls, and it appeared that nothing was safe from eavesdroppers. The police called their UHF systems personal radio, and although this term referred to the fact that each officer had a portable set, many took this to mean that the system could not be overheard. However, communication security was non-existent. As time went on, domestic and hobby electronics became less expensive and usage of these hobby radio scanners increased. Until they were in more widespread use, the authorities weren't too concerned. Basically, they weren't aware that criminals, or hobbyists for that matter, were listening in to police, official and commercial systems. Now, the whole business of radio was governed by laws such as the Wireless Telegraphy Act of 1949, the Interception and Communications Act of 1985, and a statutory instrument, which was a regulation and not a law, and was known as the Wireless Telegraphy Apparatus Regulations. In short, without getting too technical, this meant that you could listen to authorised broadcasts and licensed radio amateurs only. So, monitoring things such as aircraft, ships, taxis, the emergency services and all matter of utility transmissions was, and still is, technically illegal. Then there was mobile phones. Under the Interception of Communications Act of 1985, the only people allowed to listen to such calls were those authorised to do so by a warrant issued by the Secretary of State and it was likely that a national security breach would have had to have taken place before such a document was issued. If you were caught, and caught meant taping them, logging the conversation and frequency, and if you had them in the memory banks of your scanner, the law was clear. It said that a person who intentionally intercepts a communication in the course of its transmission, by post or by means of a public telecommunication system, shall be guilty of an offence and be liable to either a fine not exceeding the maximum or imprisonment for a term not exceeding two years, or both. Then came a spate of events which brought the attention of the authorities to the fact that anything said on radio anywhere can be heard unless it's encrypted. The police were coming across criminals who were listening to police systems and security company radios as part of their business. Arrests were made at the scene of burglaries where, as part of the offender's kit, was a radio scanner. It was usually found that the scanner had either been shoplifted from the local Tandy or had been stolen when a car or house was broken into. Often these sets were not accompanied by their instruction manual, so it was found that some of the frequencies entered were not too useful, but often they had the local police frequencies. Being caught with a scanner may well have caused the police to invoke a clause such as being equipped to commit a crime. If you were out with your scanner and you had the local constabulary's radio channels in the scanner's memory, what evidence could you put before a judge that would make him see you as just an enthusiast? Of course you'd only raise suspicion walking around with a scanner in your hand rather than an armchair enthusiast in the comfort of his own home. 
seizure of a radio scanner could only take place under Section 5B of the 1949 Wireless Telegraphy Act if such a seizure was ordered by a court and on conviction. Now, that took effect in January of 1991, and not a lot of people knew it at the time. In 1993, there was a couple of prosecutions regarding the use of radio scanners for listening to police frequencies. One was at the Kilmarnock Sheriff Court, where the youth involved was fined several hundred pounds and his scanner was ordered to be destroyed. And the other was in Manchester and involved an unemployed man who was unfortunately fined 200 pounds plus £30 in cost. Now, a police officer reportedly said at the time, we prosecuted a scanner whaler on my patch last year when the Wally turned up to a shout. Unfortunately for him, he's known to us anyway, so when he failed to give a reasonable excuse for coincidentally turning up, his car was searched and two handheld scanners were found. Most unfortunately for Mr Scanman, when the officer turned it on, he could hear his mates just down the road dealing with the incident. And when out of curiosity he twiddled another knob, the radio room at Scotland Yard burst forth. Taxi companies in some towns were in dispute over business, and in some locations, so-called taxi wars erupted. Usually, these punch-ups started when one radio cab company would dispatch a driver to pick up a fare from the local market, only to find a driver from a rival outfit had beaten him to it. This became quite a sport in large towns, and it wasn't unusual to call a cab and have a whole convoy of them turn up armed with CB radios and scanners, all eager for your custom, all because they were listening in to each other's calls. Of course, in the main, radio scanning was, and still is, viewed as harmless fun by most of the authorities, with the exception of the Squidgegate incident involving Princess Diana and shortwave listener Cyril Renan, and the news story involving Paul Way and national security, which I'll cover in another video. Now, of course, there were good times when radio scanning has been welcomed by authorities, one occasion that comes to mind is when information and a tape was received by the authorities of an impending burglary of an armoury. The plan was for the offenders to burgle the armoury, steal a large number of weapons, and then commence a series of armed robberies of jewellers. Thanks to the scanner user who reported it, the plan was thwarted before it began, and all those involved were arrested and convicted. In the mid-80s, there was a sudden interest in rave parties. These parties were arranged in advance by entrepreneurs who sold tickets for the events. Although flyers were printed as adverts for these pay parties and were distributed to potential partygoers, the security of those running the events was fairly tight. They didn't want the authorities to know where and when the parties were due to occur. Now, the police were at a loss, but radio dealt them a winning hand in the guise of scanner enthusiasts. Many scanner users had, over the years, established personal contacts with either police officers or officers of other authorities. The scanners in many areas helped the authorities by informing them of where and when the raids were due to take place. The authorities didn't ask where the information was coming from, but it was obvious that the analogue cell phone system could be quite easily overheard, and people tended to think that mobile and portable phones were as secure as their normal telephone, when, in fact, the opposite was true. On another occasion, a radio hobbyist overheard a telephone conversation on his radio, which involved a reporter from a national newspaper conspiring with the wife of a prisoner to supply drugs to her husband while on a prison visit. The reporter arranged to supply the wife with a miniature camera that she would smuggle to her husband. Now, you may be wondering what the point in all this was. Well, the reporter made it quite clear in his conversation with the woman that the plan was to pay her to give the drugs and camera to her husband, who would then share the cannabis with the prisoner he was sharing a cell with. The husband would then photograph the other man using cannabis in prison. The husband's cellmate was an offender who came from a well-known family and was in receipt of much media attention at the time, and the whole game was intended to splash headlines that this vulnerable man was using drugs while in jail, and to have photographs of him using the drugs in the cell on the front page. 
and this would therefore make the woman and her imprisoned husband some money. Thanks to the scanner hobbyist, the prison authorities were alerted, the tape was played to them, and they transferred the woman's husband to another jail many miles away that night. So the actions of that radio listener, sadly now deceased, saved a vulnerable prisoner from being exploited for gain, and also saved a deal of embarrassment to the prison authorities and the Home Office. So the truth is that radio scanning for the most part has always been harmless. The law could only become a threat when people passed on what they'd heard or used that information for their own gain, but instances have been rare and of course when it's benefited the law, a blind eye has always been turned. Whilst the radio communications agency never showed up to smash some scanner owner's front door down because he was listening to marine VHF, frequencies allocated to public bodies like the police did eventually become secure, which means that today radio scanning is completely off the agenda for Ofcom. Thank you.